Of course, we only have five people. I think we could probably spread out pretty good in there <laughs> at this time. <laughs> Six okay, well, on a good day. We're getting started, and so online, we have, we're ready, and we have people here in the narthex. We have about four folk here. So we're going to have a good crowd this evening, and so we'll let people come on. And uh, we've just been chatting about this and that, guys, online, so uh, we're... We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3 tonight, once we get started. Philippians chapter 3. Once we get started. Started, we'll, uh, before we get started, we'll have some time of prayer. John's there. John. John? Hey, John. Welcome. Others will be coming on. It's kind of fun to be on this side, isn't it? To see when you're online and then you see on this side and how it plays out. I'm glad that uh, the church has, we've been able to integrate this. It's not been too hard to make it work, you know. And, uh, and we've got the there's, there's some things that we can do online during the worship that makes it even better. So we're still getting towards there. So still working on the sound part. That's been the hardest part. But we're getting there. Guys, I can't believe how far we've come in like two, a year and a half. <laughs> Thanks to you. I mean, a year and a half I've been like in this building all by myself doing <laughs> setting up stuff over here and trying to, to not, and it was so hard teaching and there was this thing and now it's like whatever is over there. <laughs> Any more coming in? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We'll get. Yeah, usually people jump on. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, any anyone here have any prayer requests or concerns? Uh, and those online, feel free to post those. I have praise. Yeah. What, Betty? Uh, Friday was the first time Donald was able to drive the car, <laughs> and. <laughs> He's doing better, so that's good. So Don's doing a little better. He was able to drive the car then. Yeah. Yeah, I can get in and drive it. She finally let me. <laughs> so she finally let me in that. Yeah. yeah. I went I went and got a shot in my knee Tuesday. So that has helped a whole lot. Okay, so a lot more. Okay, good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm old now. Drive the car. <laughs> Well, I know that we continue, continue to remember many, many people in our church, including our sister Nancy over there, grieving lost loved ones. And this last two year period has just been so much, so much, so much. You know, my life, y'all's lives, friends, family, um, friends who were active part of Mount Tabor, who moved away. Mm -hmm. It's just been so many things. And um, it's just like our, it's like we are surrounded by a rain of grief. It just is always around us. And, uh, you know, in some sense, I always wonder what the, when the Israelites uh, were exiled into Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. And you can sometimes see that in some of their songs. It's just mm -hmm. so much grief, so much loss, mm -hmm. you know. Anything else? Anyone else? Anyone have another good news? Concern? Anything? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much that we have an opportunity to gather around your written word. These words that you spoke and delivered to so many prophets and apostles in the past, collected and written down, and now they speak to us. And God, we do, we continue to remember as a church. Our church has lost so many. We've lost so much in time and energy. We pray your comfort. Sometimes it's even no, no, it's hard to know how to pray it. But we thank you, God, that you're not bound by our emotions or our thoughts. Your love and grace is even greater than those. We celebrate Don's uh, good.
good news, a good report. We celebrate uh, good news of people who are getting better, people who are having birthdays and anniversaries, and all those good things. And we so much thank you for your written word, your scripture, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so those online, I have some people here, so we're, we'll take questions and comments. And so we're in the book of Philippians, and uh, we're in chapter 3. And so basically, just a quick reminder, the church at Philippi that Paul was writing to, that church, with the city of Philippi was a Roman colony. And basically, it was full of retired Roman soldiers and lots of people who loved the emperor. And... Uh, uh, and, and, and full of lots of Gentiles from different perspectives. And so this church uh, was constantly feeling the pressure of their confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. And in addition to that, we know that this church was beloved of Paul. Paul really loved this church. They uh, supported him financially. And we also know that Paul was in prison. And he was in prison, so he was writing this letter from prison. And most likely these people who were sending financial resources and sent uh, Epaphroditus as one of their representatives who was here. He got sick. Paul was concerned about that. And so basically he was dealing with just how thankful he was. And then we get to chapter 3. And what's interesting, it's like, imagine if you are, you're talking to your spouse. Or let's say you're talking to your children or grandchild. Or let's say you're a child or grandchild. And you're hearing your parents talk about all this good stuff. And they're just talking. And all of a sudden, they stop and say, beware. <laughs> and you're like, what happened? <laughs> Where did this come from? Because once, so it's like Paul is just, just having communication with this church, things, and going back and forth, and then all of a sudden chapter 3, it's like it shifts, and in chapter 3, it opens up with these words. It says, finally, my brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord. Great. And then he shifts in a sentence to, to write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you it is a safeguard. What? I mean, you see that shift in that sentence? Like, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. So he's talking to these people who've been through tough times. He's encouraged them. And then the next sentence. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me. And for you it is a safeguard. Verse 2. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. <coughs> what has happened? <laughs> okay? Where did that come from? You know, it's kind of like when I'm preaching sometimes, and I know I do this, and I'm going along, and all of a sudden, I just kind of go there. <laughs> Y'all see me do that, you know? Everybody's like, where is Rodney going? <laughs> and then I come back. But here in Paul, Paul is going along the letter, and then all of a sudden, chapter 3, it's like this. It's like, warning. Uh, Will, you know, what was it? Uh, danger, Will Smith. I mean, it's just this... Like, what's going on here? And so, scholars have wondered, well, why such a drastic shift? And some have wondered if, if basically the book of Philippians is actually maybe two letters that have just been put together. And yet, in a sense, that would not be unusual because remember, to get, you didn't have a lot of writing stuff to start with. I mean, it was not like paper. We could just, you know, Nancy just got picked up some cardboard. You just didn't do that in the Roman, you know, they're it come by writing material. Two, to get these letters back and forth could take weeks and months. I mean, and so some of you may have known, like Don, Betty, when Don was in the military, y'all wrote my letter, and it'd take weeks to get something, and then weeks to get it back. That's what they were dealing with. And so it's very possible that when they were putting this together, they said, let's just take two or three letters, put them together from the Church of Philippi. That's a possibility. But what we do know is that Paul is now concerned. The, the tone of the letter, he is very concerned for a group of people that he cares about very much. All right, and so he says, to write these same things to you is not troublesome to me. 
And for you, it is a safeguard. So we are immediately told something is up. So those online, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to put them. I, my, my friend Linda is checking it Mike out. Mike and Pat. Mike and Pat. Hey, Mike. And Doug Fox. Hey, Doug. Welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome. If you have any comments, questions, join. So, so now what we're going to be doing is moving in Chapter 3. But guys, <laughs> Chapter 3 to me, it has warning, but as we get into it, it is some of the most beautiful words about Paul's relationship with Christ. And it is just, and so when we get into that, feel free, you're going to see some, and some of these verses you've memorized, okay? And they're gorgeous stuff. But first he has to give us the bad news. So basically he says there's some problems that we're having, okay? And so he's given a warning, and probably most likely the warning that Paul's given, he's given before. And it's a warning that has been very, very constant in Paul's ministry. And that there is a group that he called, we can call the Judaizers. All right? I know my handwriting is terrible. Can y'all generally read that? Mm -hmm. Y'all know it says Judaizers because I've told you it said Judaizers. <laughs> yeah. Nancy's like, yeah, that's the only reason we know that. Okay. So that's Judaizers, okay? And writing from the left down, you know? So a group of people, Paul would go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And he would basically say that it's not dependent upon the rituals and works that we do to be accepted into God, but based upon God's grace through Christ Jesus. But then a group of people that generally are known as Judaizers, many of them Gentile followers and believers, would come by and basically say, no, you got to do a few extra things, okay? And we know about this in the South. Yes, you need to follow Jesus, but you also cannot wear red shirts. Okay, say it like that. Yeah. Or red Hawaiian shirts. You know, <laughs> you know the, the rules. You know what I'm talking about? The, the rules that are not really in Scripture, such as, okay, yes, you can follow Jesus, but you can never, ever drink one ounce of wine or alcohol. Even though Scripture doesn't say that, but... Prime example, or you can't dance. You know, real Christians would never dance. So it's very similar, is that they're saying that there's certain things that you have to continue to abide by as that we Jewish people do. And this is important. Remember, this all began. This this stuff is flowing out of the Jewish tradition. Okay, all the leaders of Jesus was the Messiah, Jewish Messiah. And it's flowing into the Gentile world. And the question is, what of this has to go over here? And what of this doesn't have to go over here, but can just stay here? All right? It's never Paul saying because, so, but Paul is very concerned because, let's hear the language. You ready? Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. At this point, do you think Paul's a happy camper? No. Now, dogs were not in the same, you know, we love our dogs. But there's a sense that dogs weren't always, you know, beloved in the Greco-Roman world. And it was not unusual for, Gen for Gentiles to see Jewish people as dogs. You know, and scavengers, dirty. But it wasn't also unusual for Jews to also see that as Gentiles. Paul's using this language. Yeah, it's like, okay. Evil workers. Those who mutilate the flesh. You mutilate the flesh. All right. He's talking about the same group of people. And he uses three ways to describe it. If you have any questions, anybody online, just feel free to chat with me. He's setting it up to say, this is serious stuff, guys. Because this is not just you deciding, I'm going to do circumcision or stuff like that. You know, one of the things about circumcision, women don't have to, you know, they're, they're not, this is not even an issue. But women were considered part of that covenant that the men had to be part of that. But he's saying, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. Now think about this. <laughs> 
the whole idea of circumcision was one of those signs, one of those symbols, very important, that distinguished the Jewish people as God's people from everyone else. Okay? It was, it, it carried with it not just a ritual, but it was also a sign of who you were as a people. You know, it, it, it was an important. If I say the name Betty, that says something about you, Betty. It's not everything, but I know what Betty is. And so circumcision, it was the sign of that covenant. It, it represented the tradition, not just the ritual, but it was the identity, the history, the roots of these people who had a special relationship with God. And Paul says, but where are those who mutilate? Wait a minute. Why would a Jew ever say that about the act of circumcision? Do you understand this language? And so Paul is trying to set up that there's nothing wrong with this particular act of circumcision, but there is behind it a spirit that somehow all these things make us who we are. If you don't do these things, then you're not part of our group. Now, we don't do that as followers of today, do we? Do we set up certain things that keep you in and certain things keep out? What do y'all think? Some churches mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy, it's not easy because Paul's not saying just go do whatever you want. But he's now dealing with the nitty gritty of the faith. And in verse 3, he says something interesting. He says, for it is we, so he's talking about himself, these Gentile believers, who are the circumcision. Okay? Now that's like saying, I don't want to say it, I'm trying to figure out this. Let's say if a bunch of U of L Cardinals said, and now we are the Wildcat fans. Okay, I'm trying to get an idea. It just is odd because the circumcision was the Jewish tradition. Those, Paul's saying, no, it is we. We're the circumcision. We are. And, and then he describes, so he describes those who are the circumcision, what does that look like? And he uses this language of, of, uh, of those who worship, excuse me, I get lost, those who worship in the Spirit of God, who boast in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So there's these three things. They worship in the Spirit, worship in the Spirit, boast in Jesus, no confidence in the flesh. That's no confidence, guys. <laughs> worship in the Spirit, boast about Jesus. Not about what they've accomplished or what they can accomplish or what they who they are. But they're boasting about Jesus. And they have no confidence in the flesh, in the passions, in the structures. Okay? Now, and so he's warning. There's a group of people coming. They come to you and they're telling you, Gentile believers, that yes, we're glad that you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We, he has saved us. But there's some extra things that have to happen for you to be part of the community. Now, we do say that as organizations, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what Paul is dealing with is um, a sense that if you don't do the ritual, you can't get into the system. Jesus is saying you get in by believing and trusting in God and receiving that. Then you're welcomed in. And as you're welcomed in to this, then out of that relationship is when you begin to do the works and things that are important. Any questions or confuse anybody? Any thoughts so far? I didn't know you knew shorthand. That, that's really, I don't know what that is, but let's just go with it. That's no trust in the flesh, okay? John, uh, John says legalism. Yes, it is truly much legalism. And you know, the problem with legalism, there are some things that are important. We hope to. And so there's always this, I don't know, this difficult area of uh, 
you know, the essentials of the faith, the non-essentials of the faith, okay? And there's always these gray areas sometimes, and we all can fall into it. But the more important question that we have to ask ourselves, do you have to be my identity to be with me as a follower of Jesus? Do you have to do that? So prime example, we are Americans. To give an example, let's pretend, let's say that we as American Christians tell Russian Christians, yes, you can become a follower of Jesus, but you also need to become American. You get in that sense there? That's kind of what was, that's what they were kind of saying. Yes, you can be, yes, you can follow and be part of this, you can say, but you really got to come like us. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's like, you got to do all these other rituals along with everything else. And, and Paul is saying, no, it's about the spirit of Jesus and who you have confidence in. And, and, and maybe that will get a taste of it, like how, how we do it like it'd be like if Chinese Christians said okay you can be part of the community of faith but you got to become like as Chinese to Americans you see because behind our tradition is this whole series of things we lose but the faith of Jesus is what this gospel is it's global and it can be difficult to know what are the essentials and what the non-essentials you know, we all know that. You have been following Jesus a long time. We all know that. And, and like John said, legalism, I have to do this to be accepted by Jesus. On the other hand, being in Christ does lead me to a certain lifestyle governed by love and the Spirit. Any questions so far? Any questions? Okay. Now, one other... I was going to say, Patricia, Go Patricia Buddy, you're on here, too. Hey, Patricia, welcome. Hey, good buddy. Crowd. Good crowd. Buddy. Okay. Buddy. Did you have a question? Buddy. Buddy. Hey, buddy. Peggy, welcome. Good crowd tonight. Good, good, good. <laughs> so we're in chapter 3, first few verses. Paul is warning these people that he loves very much. Watch out for these. Now, come in very subtle. They'll say, yeah, I'm glad you believe in Jesus like me. But if you really got it, if you really, but in order to really get into it, you got to be a lot like us. Okay? It's very subtle. And it's what cults do. Sex do, you know, all those groups. We clergy are very, part of we clergy, if we're not careful, we could pull people in. We could say, yeah, you're following Jesus, but in order to be really accepted by God, you need to fill up that little pan. Mabel Rodney with a whole bunch of money. Mm -hmm. It's very subtle. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? saying? There's nothing wrong with picking up the offering. but it's, So we are dealing with these struggles. Now, the place, guys, that we ourselves are dealing with it, and let's just, uh, in a place I see in our context as Americans, is this area. And I see it subtle and I hear it like, you know what I'm talking about? Politics. So let's hit the rubber where the road is. Let's go after our struggle, okay? It would be like Democratic Christians or Republican Christians saying, you can't really be a Christian. And I hear this a lot, don't back, unless you also vote a certain way, you understand an issue like this. It's very subtle. You see what I'm saying, guys? And, and so, the moment when someone in a political party starts telling me, real followers of Jesus, I just shut it off. Because they're now going to a form of legalism, and it is political legalism. This is where we are struggling with in our society. Now, I know I'm going on, I'm stepping on toes a little bit, guys, but I love y'all. <laughs> but we have to be honest about this. We really do. That, uh, and I hear it on Facebook, I sometimes see it on TV. It's like, we who follow Jesus and believe, yes, but there's some extra stuff. No, there's no extra stuff. Anybody, anytime someone says, 
It's God's love and grace. And I'm like, well, let's be careful. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and we have we have the book to go by that early people didn't have anything but the Jewish writings. Exactly, and, uh, So they did. So when Paul came through with all this, it was what? Well, wait a minute. Where were you getting that? Linda, that's excellent. <laughs> Linda, Linda made a good point. I hope you all heard that. Basically, you had the Hebrew Scripture. Mm -hmm. Jesus was the Messiah fulfillment of it. And then you had all these other apostles who were writing these things. And they're like, yes, who's, who's got the real stuff here? And the Jewish believers are like, hey, wait a minute. Look in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Circumcision is left and right for the people of God. Okay? It's, it's, it's critical. It's important. And it's hard. I mean, it is hard as a fall of Jesus when you have things that are really important in your tradition that may not be essentials, but they're so as non-essential, so important to you, okay? Let me give an example. Um, I grew up Baptist, okay? And one of the reasons Baptists developed, many Baptist churches developed a very strong uh, anti-drinking alcohol attitude. And the reason why, if you study the history, when Baptists were, when they were moving into the frontiers, bringing and conversion for coming, there was a whole bunch of alcoholism. And men particularly would be abusive when they drank. They were just, and so alcohol became known as devil juice, or whatever terms you may have heard it called. Well, there was reasons why you had those. It was good to start with. But over time, they took on a lot of itself to those who just took a sip of alcohol. You're bad now. You see how these things can develop? So a lot of times it was a good. So the, at the, rip, the ritual of circumcision at that time and place was a beautiful picture of a sign that the Jewish people could say this reflects an important covenant. It was like the wedding ring. Okay? But the reality is People have different ways to show they're married to God and it's Gentiles. They may not need a wedding ring. Does that make sense? But we, and so Paul is now uh, about to move. So he's basically warning them and he talks about stuff. And then he says, for those who boast in Jesus have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. Now Paul's about to say, okay, all these people who are coming to these evil workers who are causing problems, they boast about, okay, we are the we are the Jewish believers, we have all this. Paul says, okay, let me do a little boasting now. Okay, this is really funny. Paul does this sometimes with his art. He's a master arguing, and so he's gonna say, if we're gonna boast about the Jewish credentials, let me tell you mine. Okay? So then what he does, he says, if we're gonna make that the ground by which we are accepted. In God's family. Verse 4 he says, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, that would be these rituals that we do with our bodies and hands. I have more. He's like, okay, you guys think that you can shoot some basketball? I'm the Michael Jordan of basketball shooting. And he starts laying it out. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, I was not a convert. I grew up with two Jewish mamas and uh, two Jewish parents, a mama and a dad. We're pretty certain that Paul may not have been born in Israel, but we do know his parents were very Jewish. He says, I am a member of the people of Israel, like you. Then he gets even more vocal. And I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why is that important? Okay. He's like, well, we had the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. You remember there was a point after Solomon, the 12 tribes split. Ten of the tribes went, were the northern tribes. They became known as Judah. No, not Judah, Israel. They were called actually Israel. And you'll see that in Kings and Chronicles. Two other tribes, one called Judah and one called Benjamin, stayed with King David's line. You get this? He says, you guys may have been part of the Israel tribes. I am a, I am of the tribe of Benjamin, okay? You got that? And he's like, we never left King David. You guys did, okay? You got that? Then he goes that says a Hebrew born of Hebrews. 
And then he says, as to the law. You guys kept bringing up the law? A Pharisee. Okay? The Pharisees were strict. He was a Pharisee. So he was not just, it'd be like, not only is he a clergy, he's the bishop clergy. Okay, you got what I'm saying? He, he's like, I am a Pharisee. He's like boasting. He says, as to zeal, if you want to talk about who was committed to the Jewish faith, I was a persecutor of the church. I mean, I was like against these people. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He's saying when it came to the Jew, all those 600 something Jewish laws, he didn't break them. Okay? So it's kind of like these people who are causing you problems, they're going to talk about all their confidence in their flies. And Paul's like, okay, you guys are some little basketball player in high school. I'm Michael Jordan. You got this? Now, why is he doing this? He says that we're going to boast about our credentials. You know? If we're going to boast about our credentials and, 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 and base it and base our salvation, identity, and purpose on what it means to be Jewish, he says, I've got the credentials. I have the best. I, I got the best. You know? He's got the right stuff. And so. But hear what he says in verse 7. This is good. Y'all read. I want y'all to read. Uh, Linda, can you read verse 7? This is so beautiful. Uh, chapter 3. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is King. Uh, this is sounds the cool. new it's King a, James. That version. sounds good. Verse 7 of chapter 3. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Betty, why don't you read your translation? Verse it's, 7. It's about the same thing. Uh -huh. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for okay. Christ. You're getting this? He's saying all this stuff that we can boast about, and I can boast like the best. Mm -hmm. I can I can throw out my credential cards, and he pulls out his wallet and says, I got ch -ch 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 -ch. all these great things that have been accomplished, everything. You know? I mean, so let's move it into modern day. You know, if you're a Republican or Democrat, go there. Those are our two big divide points. As a Republican, I grew up in a Republican family. I kissed the hands of Ronald Reagan, you know? <laughs> Democrats, I grew up in a Democratic family. I kissed the hands of John Kennedy, you know? They're throwing out their credentials. Or, when it comes to being an American, I wear red, white, and blue underwear. I have, it bleeds in my skin. I have done all this, okay? You get what I'm saying? Prove it. <laughs> Prove it. I'm trying to give you the idea of what Paul's trying to do here. He says, I was the best among the best who could, but yet what gains I've had, I've come to regard as lost because of Messiah. Now that is beautiful. I mean, that's like saying, I accomplished all this stuff, good stuff, but now it's just lost to me. Because of Messiah. And that's where we gather at, friends. That's where... That's as all the things that it was important to him. Exactly. Um, it's not as important as Christ. Exactly, Betty. And for Paul, it was not just an intellectual, it was like an intimate body, soul, Awareness of Messiah. All this stuff is important, but it's just not as important as Jesus Christ. Verse 8 he says, More than that. Okay, wait. Okay, he's already said everything is lost. <laughs> you get what I'm saying here? But more, I mean, he's like, More than that? What's more than that? You've pretty much said all your credential cards are just. Also, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I suffered the loss of all things. Mm -hmm. I regard them as, some translations, rubbish, rubbish. trash, and 
order to gain who? Christ. Now guys, I don't know about you, but to read something like that, I mean, it'd be like anybody who has accomplished everything they've ever wanted to accomplish, and they stop and say, but you know, that's just false. It's not as valuable as knowing Jesus the Messiah. And him knowing me. And out of that relationship, I could have a relationship with you guys, Gentiles, Jews, and find out what's really important. Because once I say that Jesus is the most valuable, then Jesus can begin to tell me other things that are valuable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We have a tendency of saying, these things are valuable, and Betty, in order for you to be in my group, you gotta do them. That's, but if I say, all of us are saying, Jesus, the Messiah, that's <clears throat> most valuable, then we can work out all these other things together. Does that make sense? That we get our gathering point is not about our identity or what we've done. And this is, that means guys, everybody's invited to this. Yeah? Well, this is this like uh, circumcision and then baptism and, and things. All of that is mumu. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ Himself, exactly, Don. You and and it is, it is belief, but it is it is also a deep, intimate awareness. It's like when you're debate. If you're thinking about if I need to do this, this, and this, you're thinking, but which way does Christ want me to go? You know, I as a pastor, I could come up with a lot of good ideas. I mean, I have a lot of great good ideas. <laughs> I can boast about wonderful ideas. But Paul would say all that is just loss. To know Jesus. And then out of that flows whatever good ideas or not bad ideas. You know, making sense? And you've hit it on this that we need to come back to what really is important. And in our society now, guys, and this is what's scary. The prophets and apostles of politics, entertainment, they tell us, you gotta hate this person, love this person, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. Paul says, what, you, what I call you to do is to know Messiah. Fall in love with Jesus. And then all that stuff is fully worked out. And so Paul would say, yes, Jewish believers, circumcision is important to you, it's okay. Get circumcised as much as you want, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Gentiles, you don't have to. That's not gonna get you in God's kingdom. Yes, if we should eat kosher food or not eat kosher food, that's really important. We respect people's con we respect people's consciousness. Because I love Jesus, Don. If there's something you do that you know I can't do, that's not really immoral, it's just something you do. You know, you play golf. Let's say I think golf is an immoral activity. Well, we know golf is an immoral activity. But I'm not going to let that determine my intimate relationship with you and with you. Does that make sense? Paul is trying to make what's important important and what makes secondary secondary. And But I don't know, but I think these are some beautiful words, guys. I just... Paul sets this up to says, we're going to boast. I've got the credentials. <laughs> I'm the best. But all that is just lost to me. When Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, and Jesus began to reveal him over those next few years, this zealous guy full of all the credentials discovered something far more important, and that Jesus was the fulfillment. He was the fulfillment. Messiah of all that the Jews had hoped for. <clears throat> and then God said, you're going to be the one to take that to the Gentiles. And you know, Paul had to work that out. There had to be moments when God was talking to us, you know, and having it like, wait a minute, God, you mean you don't want the Gentiles, they don't have to do that? That makes no sense. <laughs> We've been doing that as Jewish people for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We thought that was the most important thing about being God's people. And you're telling me no, no. But God, 
Paul's not saying to our Jewish friends, those things we do are not important to you. You know what I'm saying? We can go and, and celebrate the Jewish holidays and, 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 and celebrate Passover with them, you know? But it's not, we know as Gentiles aren't required of us. But we honor our Jewish tradition because I think the Western church has gone the opposite end. We've become so uh, not aware of our Jewish roots. We're out no no land right now. So coming back to knowing our roots, as I talk about in my sermons, it's not that we become Jews, but we know why we do what we do. Does that make sense, guys? Sure. Any questions or comments from there, mm -hmm. Linda? Comments, any re feedback, anybody? Guys that are sitting here, any thoughts? Did I get you all to like, you know? Well, it's just like in families, different families have different traditions. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's ha handed down from one century to another. Yeah. But that don't mean everybody has to do exactly. what they do. Becky, and, that, and Betty, that's such a good idea. Those And those traditions are important to you. I mean, think about it. That's what passes on your identity. And uh, and if say that was something that was part of lots of people in your family, and then someone comes along and says, well, those are important, but you can have a relationship with these people, and they don't do those traditions. You know what I'm saying? It, it, yeah, you've hit it right on the point. And in our American culture, we really are going to have to be careful on this. Who you vote for, what you believe about this issue is important. I'm not saying it's not. And I think we who follow Jesus should gather around Scripture to try to discern what's the best route. But we never need to let those be the identity that we have as following Jesus. Because God wants a multicultural global family. You know, if you think about it, just think about this, guys. And just think about it, okay? I'm just going to push this a little bit, okay? Because you're my people, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. He was a dark-skinned Jewish man, part of a culture that's not like ours, okay? He did all these, he, he participated in all these rituals that we don't participate, traditions. I mean, all that stuff. I mean, Sabbath was observed. You didn't work on Sabbath. It, it was not like, okay, maybe play a little golf. No, there's none of that. There was, you, he followed those traditions. And he was part of a world, nothing like the Western world. Okay? Now, so many years later, we sit around as a bunch of Gentile white people. You know what I'm saying? With a whole different culture. we can also know this Jesus who's nothing like us. Does that make sense? And he accepts our culture. He celebrates it. And he says now you can join with my my Middle Eastern brothers and sisters and my Chinese brothers and sisters and, and you can also join with those brothers and sisters in America that really ticks you off. Those who like the UK and, or U of L, you know, all that stuff. And you can last and you can even hang out and like even though you disagree with the progressive followers of Jesus and the conservative ones, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it gets harder and harder and more emotionally stable. But, but the real point is, who is who do you want to know? What is your surpassing knowledge? So we're going to end there because we'll continue on a little bit more because it gets even better. Okay, it gets <laughs> better. Because he's, he's already set it up. So any questions, final comments here about... I'm excited about this because what it does to me, guys, when I talk, teach stuff like this, it both excites me, but it makes me realize how far I am what I want to be in Christ. I don't know if that makes sense. It's like what little I know of my Lord, it just makes me realize how much I don't know of my Lord and how far I have to still go. So it's both and. Maybe y'all don't feel those feelings, but I do. It's just this... This over sense that, oh man, I want to know Jesus even deeper than I've ever wanted to know him. I want him to change my body, my mind, my heart. That's what I see here, Paul, guys. This is what I'm seeing he is trying to get out. Then we can work out all the secondary issues. <laughs> you know, you got that? Then we can work out the family traditions. Any questions? There's okay. something else, uh, too, that makes me wonder. Now, 
like in my family, I got two kids mm -hmm. that won't get this COVID shot. Mm -hmm. That upsets me. And they, I know it upsets them if I try to, you know, I persuade them. So really, I shouldn't do much talking against them not doing something. But I'm good at doing that sometimes because I think that's really silly on their part. I thought they were smarter than that. And Betty, but <laughs> but made, that is not right. Betty, to that's do a that. good point. You make a very good point. Right now, we are struggling over the vaccination and masks. How does, how would Christ have us do this? That's when some point. of us have some deep mm -hmm. convictions, whatever reasons, wrong or right, how do we do that? How do we remain followers of Jesus? Well, good place to begin. You just hit it. Let's spend a little bit more time getting to know Jesus on this one. <laughs> How would Jesus want us to do this? You know, would Jesus start saying, like, I was vaccinated, and then I start getting those feelings, maybe I'm like, well, you know, Rocky, there's a few things that would be good for you to do health-wise, but you don't do them. Wait a minute, Jesus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He, he starts talking to you. Now, I'm not saying that that's proof perfect, but you're right. It's, it's, people have convictions about things and there may be reasons why. And yes, I know what's happened in our society. I hear some people say, if you get the vaccination, you're a bunch of sheep who are just led astray. And on the opposite end, I hear people who say, don't get the vaccination. You hate science, you're just, going crazy. We've heard those. Most of us are right here, aren't we? We're brothers and sisters and family members, and we're trying to know how to make this work. How would the Christ that we love, how does that play out with those who disagree over something really important to us, vaccination and handle mask? So when the trustees meet, they have to <laughs> make these decisions, you know. Yes, it's a have issues of health, life, but others would, would say it's also issues of liberty issues. You know, there's all those factors that are in play. And so I think you made a good point. You've hit it right on. How do I hold on to what I think is medically, emotionally, spiritually important and still reach out to those who disagree? That makes sense. You know, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy right now in our culture. I don't think, I really think if the church in America cannot get this right, then how is anyone else going to get it right in America? If followers of Jesus can't find ways to come across these deep disagreements and find a ways to make it work, and we have a common source, is Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? We've got to be the ones. Maybe we can do this. I'm like, come on, we've got to work it out. And, and I don't do it perfectly, and I struggle with it. But I know if, if you will love the Jesus that I love, then we've got a good place to begin, wouldn't you say? And that's what Paul would say. That's a good place to begin. And then we work out all the other details that we have to work out. Because... I know that Rodney can't save you guys, and you can't save me. <laughs> I know that. But that's a good point. You hit it right on, man. Thank you for sharing. I know that was not easy to share. <laughs> but I appreciate you opening your heart like that, friend. And I don't know. I got, just today, I'm walking this afternoon. Lord God, I don't know what we should do here. It's just so hard right now. Anything else before we close? You can get me off on another sermon. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Anything online? Anybody? Any questions? No, John just had an amen. Amen. But that was back away. So. Okay. John. <laughs> he, he was and, amen uh, and something. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just close uh, with these words of prayer. Yet whatever gains I had, these have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Internet people. <laughs> <laughs>